Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Pavilion of Uzbekistan at the, at the Venice Biennale. Uh, I'm Camilo Oliveira and together with uh, Sheda Gomashi and Space Caviar, we curated the, the Pavilion of this year. It's a huge pleasure to have you here. And this is the third chapter of these gatherings that we are doing. Um, and the first two, they happened during the opening days at the Biennale, and we were discussing about this idea of representing Uzbekistan in an international context of the Venice Biennale. And the second one, we talked about um, art in the meta space. So today we are here with all of you, and the Pavilion of Uzbekistan takes the starting point, the figure of Muhammad ibn Musa al Khwarezmi, the 8th century mathematician that was born in a region that is today considered Uzbekistan. And his work laid the base and gave origin to modern mathematics and modern computer science. Um, we are here today to, to share our thoughts on the, these questions and to, to come up to discuss how this, uh, his influence are with, uh, within us today. 1,200 years ago, there was this idea of coming up with the, the he laid the basis for algorithms. And today we are having this uh, participating on our everyday life. So I would like to um, Welcome all of you, and perhaps we could do a round of introduction with each one of you to uh, that you could tell me a bit, or that you could tell us a bit of your practice and expand a bit how uh, your work is uh, interlacing, or it's also coming together with this uh, this topic that we will be touching upon. So I don't know who do you uh, do you want to. Ask? Yeah. The introduction policy and I do, yes. Uh, a strate not very strategic spot choice, I must say. Um, so, well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Shada and um, uh, Camilla. Uh, it's very, like, when I kind of think about um, decolonizing data and the question that actually uh, Nishant asked, how do we... Uh, kind of define data for ourselves. But I think um, when we were discussing everything, I kind of um, realized that my way of decolonizing data is closely linked to uh, digestion. And I'm actually using this um, sort of term that I heard um, Paul Preciado speak about, kind of, kind of related to artistic practices. And um, I think, to me, kind of that's the way, um, that's the main mode of my artistic production, this digestive system, and then sort of making it into something else. And I think, kind of, when I think about my general approach uh, to my oeuvre, pardon the word, is um, I kind of don't uh, think about my practice as um, separate from sort of history of art. Whatever I make, I make in that one flow. And whatever I do, I sta I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of other artists. I'm, I don't know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants of some sorts. Um, and this sort of acceptance of other artist methodologies and other flows of artworks kind of allows me to make that next step in that process. With this, if I accept this, of course, this means that I have to allow my practice to be absorbed in exactly the same way. So, and this is where my, for example, archiving impulse comes from, where we do at the studio kind of lectures on archiving, on studio systems, and a publication that I'm starting to work on, on studio systems and artistic methodologies. So this kind of belonging to one flow is, um, I guess, essential to me. And maybe one last thing, since it's only an introduction right now, that I will say, is that um, I think of my practice, I can't sort of limit my practice recently to a set of ideas, but I uh, think about it as a gesture. Um, it's about pushing um, against the walls, testing membranes, testing sort of boundaries, be it institutional, be it um, social or something like that. So it's kind of this uh, constant checking 
of the, uh, I don't know, fragility of walls, borders. I think that's how I uh, lately been thinking about uh, my practice. And I'll end here. Hey, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Elisa Giardina Papa, and thank you for the invitation of being here. Um, and okay, let's make it quick because I think it should be more like a discussion than just introducing yourself. But uh, I'm an artist, I work with uh, video art installation mainly. Um, in the last years, uh, let's say six years, uh, I've been producing this ongoing, uh, at this moment is a trilogy of artworks uh, that is dedicated to uh, care, affected, care, affected labor and artificial intelligence. And the focus of these works is the, I would say, the invisible human infrastructure that is sustaining uh, on one side, the supposed uh, autonomy of the liberal subject, and it's also sustaining uh, the dream of artificial intelligence. Uh, so what I see is that there is this like promise of uh, technology that will make our life uh, better, uh, more efficient, we will be liberated by kind of like works and things that we, want, we don't want to do. But what I try to see with my work is actually that this premise is quite uh, uh, just a premise because uh, one of the work that I did is uh, about like affected care online. So they kind of like invisible workers who are like uh, providing uh, care service online. And then on the other side, I've been like investigating, addressing, and try to understand more about the workers that are uh, sustaining artificial intelligence with invisible labor. For example, like by cleaning data and making like all the uh, kind of like hidden work that is necessary to train uh, supposedly autonomous uh, algorithms. So not so smart in, in uh, artificial intelligence. I think that is enough as a presentation. Um, I saw <laughs> Should I sit over here? Is that better? Uh, if I sit? Over there. Okay. <laughs> this is messing up the order. Maybe, okay. It's um, not algorithmic. Yeah, it's not algorithmic. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Space Caviar, for inviting me um, to join this um, discussion. Um, my name's Ibiye Camp, and um, I'm an artist, and my practice since 2019 really has been um, really exploring um, the digital language, um, really, um, way that. Um, maybe data kind of creates forms and meshes and reads the landscape. Um, I predominantly try to, you know, maybe unlearn some digital kind of um, languages as a huge kind of um, roadblock, kind of, um, ro not robo, um, the kind of meshes and forms that you can find online open source um, tend to be very geometric and this kind of particular kind of digital um, avatar language. And so with my work, um, I use scanning techniques in order to, you know, create a mesh or create a scan of a landscape. And um, the practice is really into interrogating the, the scan and what kind of data or qualities are kind of registered or understood. And through that process, I start to kind of identify certain biases that are embedded within how we kind of use technology or how technology kind of reads us and space. And this reveals a lot of kind of issues, particularly in um, kind of spaces like very busy areas in Balogon Market in Lagos, Nigeria, or even um, the, the work kind of touches on um, how uh, people of color are read in surveillance and things like that. So, yeah, it's it's particularly a very visual practice I have, um, but particularly kind of the the power of also being a bit of a outsider in technology kind of gives the eye to kind of seeing what we are missing from certain technological softwares. 
Um, yes, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Nishant Shah. I will also join both of you for inviting us and for curating this very interesting set of conversations. Um, I am going to claim the space of being a researcher, like not an artist and not a designer. Uh, I have a professorship in aesthetics and cultures of technology at Artes University of the Arts and Radboud University in the Netherlands. And because a lot of my work actually looks at relationships between digital technologies and the law, uh, I also am a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, which is at Harvard University in the US. Um, I think my primary provocation that came in participating in this conversation was because over the last few years, I have been trying to reject the paradigm of data as the default paradigm of understanding digital and computational realities. Um, because the more we keep on buying into the idea that data is the only way of talking about what happens within computation, we keep on reinforcing the idea that data is the only thing we should be considering. Um, last year, in a, in a book that came out with Alexandra Yuhas and Chanel Langlos, uh, we have a book out called Really Fake, uh, where we talk about what happens to arts, culture, storytelling, and human forms of being in a world where data is the only paradigm through which to look at it. Um, it's an open access book if people want to have a look at it. Shameless plug from academics. Um, because nobody curates us in festivals. We have to come and talk about our books. Uh, but but I, I kind of find the book fascinating because it does, for example, talk a lot about uh, different forms of embodiment, uh, different kinds of untranslatability, uh, different modes of being. Uh, and my favorite plug for the book is that the book essentially tries to tell us about what happened in our digital realities that Hello Kitty is no longer a cat. Um, if this is a revelation to you, I'm very sorry for spoiling your childhoods. Uh, if it's not, then we should discuss more about what happened when data became the only paradigm by which to understand truths and Hello Kitty stopped being a cat. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I'm Audrey. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm trained as an object designer. Um, that, yeah, let's say that I, yeah, I'm, I'm trained as an object designer, but this, I slowly uh, started an independent practice that is a bit more um, in between art and design. Um, still, um, I would say that objects and functionality are a bit like the pre pretext for me, still centered in my work just as a mean of uh, speaking about our daily lives, let's say. And um, I would say that I am more a maker, um, and but a maker that would um, use um, digital images processes in order to reconsider um, object design methodologies and the way we are thinking and shaping matter in our digital times. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you also for inviting me here. I'm really happy to be here and uh, how I just maybe said also, but I said it before, uh, I'm really happy that we, I mean, uh, Uzbekistan, we have our pavilion and yeah. So um, to my introduction, uh, I'm Faina. I'm an um, experimental artist, really, um, I would say, and um, my focus uh, in my works is uh, more about identity and how it change uh, during, um, during technology. And uh, my um, work is sometimes uh, that I working undercover, <laughs> like I'm exploring social media and um, I'm trying uh, to put me in, in different roles like influencer, blogger and fashion and like that. And uh, that's a way how I work uh, with uh, data <laughs> and uh, digital space also. And uh, for me, um, technology is also really physical um, experience and it's not about smartphone or something like that. It's, uh, it's something what influence us every minute and uh, so um, this point I think it's very interesting for me to research it and uh, and also in that uh, what I do with identity and um, digital 
Um, I have uh, other questions like um, like uh, my past also I'm questioning and uh, then we can go to the <laughs> another topic of my work it's uh, a post-soviet uh, heritage uh, and uh, so it's also like a post-colonial thinking so um, or decolonial um, and 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 this all stuff I mean like a uh, woman and post-soviet heritage and identity and digital that's, that's what uh, connect my work and um, yes, for that, uh, with that, I'm working. So thank you. OK, um, thank you, everyone. Um, yes. No? Yes. Yeah. OK. So I wanted to um, touch upon something that during our discussions, like pe previous discussion, uh, something that you mentioned that um, let's define each one of us what is um, data and uh, in some cases in some works like the work of um, Ibia it, it is somehow um, more um, visible more uh, understandable what is the data that she's um, talking about but in some some works like the work of audrey or work of taus i i see it a little bit more um difficult to or more um far uh, farther than what we imagine as like usually described as data so i would like to start with you taus again like say a little bit talk about but when we talk about like decolonizing the data which data you are talking about in your work um, yes thanks um let's next one maybe we can shuffle a bit <laughs> just throwing it out there um so what kind of data are we talking about i think i um like i consider um um i have some notes actually that i've made for this um for the talk let me just open it up one second um <laughs> so i don't know like i think about data as um i think kind of it's a mixture of things and i'm not sort of um i'm not interested in um i think kind of i don't know clean data if that even exists i'm i'm sort of um i'm in i collect i guess i consider everything i encounter data whether it's stories about people um, lost at sea, whether it's, um, I don't know, um, actual data of, uh, I don't know, sound levels um, that uh, constantly abuse you when you sleep, whether it's sort of, I don't know, other forms of leakages. Um, and I don't know, maybe I can give, uh, oh, too many I don't know. Uh, maybe I can give an example of um, me uh, digesting data into something else. And actually, I'm wearing uh, a work uh, that is, to me, kind of a pure um, uh, pure sort of example of that data digestion. It's a jewelry piece uh, that I've done together with Mineral Weather. And um, it's called Mining Serendipity. And it's very much um, rethinking um, things that we, um, rethinking data collections and things like, I don't know, horizon scanning, effective uh, forecasting, or um, hive mind or swarm intelligence, because every pendant on this sort of chain, or on this story, it rethinks that and tries to claim it back from, um, I don't know, predicting uh, behavioral patterns in order to extract more labor. And I don't know, I can give maybe um, just uh, which one? Which one? Oh, my favorite one is this one. Um, you can't see it, but I guess it's not about seeing. Um, it's called Syncacord Nuggets, and it's based on things like um, steam engine effect. Um, my friend told me about it. It's apparently from cyber feminism. I never found a single citation on it, actually, so I can't really use it, but I'm just saying. But this also becomes this, you know, kind of I collect hearsay, w which has no sort of proof, I guess, and that also becomes something else. And sometimes I manufacture proofs for that. And also it's based on things like multiple discovery uh, or, um, uh, or accidental 
no coincidental plagiarism. It's basically phenomena that describe that when s same ideas come into the world at the same time, be it artists, be it musicians writing the same tune, and being scientists uh, sort of producing something. So it's this kind of feeling of time where things just happen without sort of being plagiarized. Um, another thing, I think this one is, um, um, no, actually maybe, maybe this one. Um, this one is called Remote Synesthesia Crystal, and it's based on mere synesthesia, this feeling, you know, when of heightened sort of empathy that you feel um, looking at someone who's in pain. Some people have it with actually artworks, when you see like a canvas being slit, you feel, feel that pain. Um, so, and we made it up into remote synesthesia, which doesn't exist. So it's when you kind of get this heightened empathy without even seeing a pain of another. <coughs> I'm actually very curious to Nishan about what you're saying of the Hello Kitty. If the Hello Kitty, uh, it's not a cat, uh, how, how would we start keep on thinking about this idea of the data? So in your research, how have you come across? What are the other points of uh, what, what should be that we should be talking about also and not focusing so much about data, which would be the expansion of this, uh, the idea. Because of course, um, machines, they are made by humans and humans, they put their bias and their predictions or they, they put, they translate everything that they think into the, the, into the algorithms, into the, the computer. So what would it be this expansion of, what would be the other, how do you consider other things not as data, if data, it's also information. It's how how to, to differentiate what you're considering data and um, what would expand about something else? Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a tough question simply because we have we have kind of come to accept the narrative that computers deal with data right except that data is a measurement there is no such thing as data as an object data is not a thing data is merely something that is produced because a measurement has been put into place which says this if it fits these specific criteria is now data and hence we can analyze it right so even in the history of computation like 20 years ago what was considered data and what was not data is now kind of kept on included into the fold of computation itself so i have been quite fascinated by thinking through saying why is it that we keep on emphasizing that data is the only framework through which to attend to this. If you're looking at images, to stories, to fabricated past, through fictions, through histories, what does it mean as a political act to call these things data? Because what we are essentially saying is that this is a form by which these kinds of different informations, which are often embodied and human and fictional, uh, are being made intelligible to a specific system of knowing. And that we are kind of reinforcing the idea that this is the only system that is worth knowing, right? Um, so I work with a fairly uh, large collective called FemtechNet. And within FemtechNet, we've come up with feminist technologies and networks. Um, within that, we've come up with five um, touchstones by which you want to kind of push against data as an object. Um, kind of, and it's, it's called the meals framework. So it's, it's basically that data is material. You need to go back to the materiality of the information that you are trying to call data. Because in calling something data, something will always be lost. And what will be lost is its materiality. So how do you kind of bring it back? Um, meals, so E, second one is embodied. Data is not an abstract set of information. It always, always is written onto our bodies, either visibly or invisibly. Bringing the body back into that conversation and calling something data is really important. Third, I think is already kind of mentioned saying that data is affective, right? It's presented to us as rational, but it's incredibly irrational, neurotic, splintered, and, and, and deeply and profoundly emotional as an experience. Um, we were doing field work in India, for example, where they were building a biometric database system. Um, there was a data glitch where servers moved from, like data moved from one server to the other and a column which was supposed to have people who are alive shifted to a people who are dead. And there was 60,000 people who woke up one morning and they were told that data says you are dead now, right? 
it data comes with these kinds of irrationalities um where are my meals oh uh, the l data requires labor and particularly thinking through these conditions of who are the people who are producing both the work of who are doing the work both of producing data but also the work of maintaining data i think data production is very easy data maintenance requires an enormous amounts of resources and these resources are generally products of feminized labor practices as well as post colonial power practices in some way uh, and as uh, we keep on talking about we need to realize that data solicits value i i have made myself unpopular in very te many technology conferences by telling them that you can't decolonize data because decolonizing data is like trying to say how do you deweaponize a gun that which was produced as an expression of colonial control and measure cannot be decolonized it can only be destroyed or dismantled so that's like just the beginning point like how do you dismantle the paradigm of data uh, by bringing in other conversations and i i constantly feel that art design and culture are the last spaces left where we might still be able to do this work um, because every other scientific discipline has already bought into the idea that we just need to contribute to data economies and systems as opposed to withdraw from them question them and kind of deconstruct them in some ways okay that was a very long answer sorry i'm going to pass on to someone else um but there is still a question for me like um what you mean is basically um we have to treat uh, if we want to dec decolonize data we have to uh, treat we have to start with the material data that we have like the history like the the long history and what is not exist what is missing from history and then arrive to the digital era or digital data that exists true is that correct perhaps um digestion is actually a much better metaphor for it it's just realizing that data does not exist in natural form right there is no such thing as raw data to call something data is to establish a measure onto it and to say that we are going to call this data is a political act so it's really thinking about these five levels of the materiality embodiment affective labor and so on in order to say before you call something data question on these things does it still need to be called data because there are other paradigms through which these things make sense because once at least i i only know computational history once within computational networks you are saying something is data you are putting it up to conditions of authentication verification transferability and transactability that's all that data does why would you want to call things data is it necessary for this thing to travel as a data set in any form or can it be archived and can it be stored and remembered and perhaps forgotten uh, as it moves along right that's the question so it's really an ontological question why are we agreeing to call things data when we know that data is a weaponized practice that datafication is an exercise of power and control established by particular kinds of measurements <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um do you have a question cuz no. i have a question from evia as so. well sure. um i was reading about your work and you mentioned it somehow about the landscape i know you were collecting data on the landscape as well and um would you please expand about it like how can we uh, somehow solve a landscape or nature by collecting by we collecting data this is really interesting i think uh, i'm still figuring that out as well and i really um the way that i was working with the landscape um wasn't necessarily i, I think some of the topics I, it could have been the project um the sacred forests of ethiopia that you were speaking of So in this project I think some of the questions were about how, um how can we reintroduce kind of like forest back into the landscape such a wide kind of question and I have a architectural background but you know I'm really like a kind of just very maybe um just visual artist and kind of very interested in in materiality and what we call data and things like that and um so with this um subject it was more about kind of um 
understanding what is recognized as, as landscape and what is, and, and rightfully so, what is recognized as data. And previously in our conversation, when we were all introducing ourselves, we were speaking about like, what is data to us? And I, the way that I saw data was something that is like valued and, um, you know, something similarly to how something is measured, it, that someone has kind of said that this is something that we should recognize or this is something that the software, this is a type of texture or light that a software would recognize. And so in terms of the landscape, I was looking at how various different landscapes that might not have been in the data pool might be recognized. And so the um, projects that began this type of practice um, began, um, I, I was in Lagos, Nigeria, and I was hoping to um, collect um, data, um, physical mesh data of moments of data exchange. So I was trying to um, collect um, moments where people would hand over their own data. So these were mobile phone top-up units, which I was scanning um, in Yaba, um, in Lagos. And when I went back to my computer to kind of formulate these meshes, I realized that actually the spaces I was scanning weren't in the data pool for how MetaShape worked. So therefore, th the meshes that were created were very voided and glitched and you know had all sorts of kind of um, kind of holes and and kind of double exposure and almost um, when you take the mesh through the various different steps um, in MetaShape, you um, have aligning the points and then um, making the mesh and then adding the texture. It ended up erasing a lot of detail, and so the the way that I continued my practice from there was actually talking about what isn't recognized as data and how um, and the many questions came from that. So the way that I see the landscape when it comes to data is that there are m moments where um, certain landscapes weren't considered at, in the production of these softwares and these technologies. And I kind of see that resistance as quite a powerful thing. It's quite powerful to be unreadable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite a, um, and I think that's w with the project, the Sacred Forest of Ethiopia, um, I was looking at the how the s sacred forests in themselves are also resistant to being um, kind of, um, you know, farmland or kind of made into other kind of neighboring villages because they are seen as as um, you know the closest thing to kind of heaven on earth so people don't kind of like touch or, or destroy the forest in any way and so I then took this practice of scanning into the forest and again the forest because the way they move in the wind and in the different types of vegetation and species that are within the forest, the scans then became extremely glitched and very kind of extrapolated and where the software would make up its own geometry in spaces that I didn't quite kind of understand. So I, I kind of see in particular my project, um, which is titled Data of the New Black Gold and my other project, The Sacred Forest of Ethiopia, these two projects in reading the landscape is really how there is, um, they're just like kind of traces on impressions of a landscape, which is kind of a unique type of typology separate to the technologies and the architectural tools that I've been using. And I'm, I'm constantly grappling with how to continue <laughs> with this type of idea, because I'm aware that I'm documenting spaces which haven't yet, you, if you look at Google Maps, of Balogon Market, you will never see it in the states that you actually experience the market because um, there is street view in, um, for Google in Lagos, but it's, it's when people aren't really on the streets. And Balogon Market, when people are on the streets, you can't drive a Google car down the street. So you never see it in its, in its actual state. But the way that I was scanning, I was scanning um, when the streets were super busy, and this is what made it kind of um, into this very glitched, kind of ghosted mesh. So, um, yeah, I've, I think there's so much power in being unreadable. And, I, and in fact, I th I'm starting to realize that the, um, the quality of the mesh um, with all of its voids is a type of data, which is the kind of the holes, the holes and the voids. That, that is kind of the unique data, which I haven't quite understood yet. 
it's not just kind of what is read, but it's kind of what is missing. Um, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's just um, a lot of uh, super interesting things that um, Ibia picked up on, um, or just told us. Um, like, I'm actually, I'm curious, like, if I can address this question about voids um, in data to everyone and in, in to these glitches. Like, what are those things that you have in your works? Like, how do you see them? How do you work with them? Like, what are they? Are they rumors, lies? And how do you, like, exactly, like, how do you grapple with it? And how do you kind of move on with this? And it also kind of this... Um, uh, voids and uh, a power and unreadable it makes me kind of remember and think about Glissan and his like right to opacity. So that w that's kind of like to me that it's a kind of a very big reference and one of the quotes um, that I've been thinking about maybe for <laughs> almost a year by that I heard uh, by uh, quoting Glissan Mantia de Awara um, at March meetings in Sharjah. He uh, quoted him that uh, kind of that you have to you can't go back to find your origin. You can't start in you. You have to go to the bottom of the sea of a sunken ship and learn to tremble together with the world. And I think like that's how at least I aspire to kind of start a work, start a practice, like not, you know, in a not wiping out, not kind of come back, coming back to like a, a mythical form of origin. I mean, speaking about myself, but kind of actually going to that middle ground transportation, whether it was a forced trans uh, transportation or non non forced, depends which history you come from, I suppose. So, but that's just kind of, a, I guess, my general rumination on Glissan. And maybe I've just started thinking about sort of glitch and lies that I've engaged uh, into throughout my practice because maybe these were kind of early voids and I don't know I lied um, I took my friend's painting of course in agreement with him and like applied to like national portrait gallery portraiture prize you know and we agreed that we would split the money if we win because he couldn't apply he applied like twice and didn't win anything or like I remember I posed as a journalist to take an interview to get to talk to like Tina Seagal of course nothing ever was published but I kind of got to chat to him by lying that I was kind of interviewing him. Like, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not sure these are like good examples, but yeah, my, my general questions of how do you deal with like voids, um, glitches, and, and on one hand, where do they come from and where do they take you? I think it could be nice, Elisa, if you could expand a bit of, on this for this idea of, because you are using emotions and or your work cleaning emotional data it's all about translating emotions into these glitches and transforming it into something that can be readable um, i don't know if there is some kind of uh, like how to translate something that is so immature that machines cannot like feel into something that can be then readable or ha these glitches i think that is something that from your work it's it's something that it's uh, it's heavily <coughs> informed from Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sh I'm, I've been thinking about glitches uh, for a long time, but it's also true that the glitch is something that works within a system that is already in place. Uh, it's a glitch of the system. But when I'm, I was like listening to um, like the way you were uh, uh, describing it, I think uh, one way to think about it, it can also be what is not translatable. Right? So what doesn't like fit uh, into the categories of data, what is not translatable and what is not computable. So the incomputability, let's say that, incomputability. And in my work with, with uh, that's why I've been working on uh, uh, emotional data and affective computing, because I wanted to see that part of computation that probably didn't make it right. Because <laughs> like really the question for me was like, how do computers like are supposed to understand emotions? And when you go there, you understand that actually in this translation of the complexity of the world, of what is opaque, of what is queer, what is like untranslatable into something that is computable, of course you like uh, have to live and like to uh, get rid of 
like the most important things, right? So for example, like in the ways in which uh, uh, through machine visions, computer are like understanding emotions, uh, is quite ridiculous really, right? Like first, like, I mean, we can like talk for like a long time, what do we think like human emotions are? Something that is like inside, outside, what is inside, do we show it in the face? Do you show it, like everybody's showing it in the same face, in the face, like even the idea that you show emotion through the face is quite ridiculous. So how computer vision does it is that uh, it needs to be in his mathematics right I mean in his calculation what was that they do is like to take the face and then they divide the face uh, uh, into like little uh, little like uh, muscle movements and then they combine the muscle movements and then if you move these muscles and then these muscles then you're smiling but if you don't move this one then you're not your smile is not truth Right, and so like when you start to do this kind of work, uh, like and like kind of like trace the history, of this kind of things that you understand that, for example, the theory of how emotions are understood through computation is goes back to the 19th century, right? And to, like to physiognomy, to like theory that are like quite you know heavily criticized. But then, when you need to translate things into data, then you kind of like go back to do this like into this like crazy theory. Uh, but so, so to me, then the question that I was like, you know, thinking right now is, um, of course, we don't want to translate everything into data, and but at the same time, we do have an impulse to uh, archive, to document, to record something that is now understood as data is now like written in archives, and as is now written in history. So then, for me, the question is like, do we just? don't do it, <laughs> we allow what is invisible to stay invisible, or we do it maybe in a different way, within a different like paradigm, within a different way of recording things. I don't know if lying is a solution. You know, like I think this could be like a, an interesting question for everybody. You know, I don't know everybody, but like with people like you are interested in like uh, uh, archiving and you know, I don't know, like uh, recount stories, like that kind of process. How do you do it? Uh, not because you're interested in English as a system, but within another kind of system. I don't know if that was an answer, but. <laughs> yes, I don't know if uh, someone if you have something or if someone has something to add to how do you work with English? In, in, in your work, for example, is this how do you measure this idea of the glitch in, in, in your work or something that it's it okay. not readable or? Um, yeah, um, I would um, maybe start it from another side and about when I thought about uh, decolonizing data, I also uh, for me was answer we cannot do it <laughs> because it's it's exist and um, yeah and uh, then I thought uh, not about data as a data I thought about when we talk about decolonizing it means it's colonized <laughs> so uh, and uh, when we see when we look on, on, on I mean, it's uh, in this context on the past from Uzbekistan, it like when we talk of also about about decolonization, what is this um, different between post colonization and decolonization? Is that for me, as decolonization, it's more uh, organic and uh, more positively way to accept uh, the things and live with that and not trying to doing something um, um, uh, or changing something first you have to accept it and then you can do something with that and uh, this way uh, I also did it as a person for me for my uh, to to research my past and uh, I also explore that for me post-colonial thinking was more destroying that decolonial thinking and uh, it's also what influence of uh, identities and um, and that's why I when I that understood uh, and in my research in social media I understood also it was interesting for me not the data as a data like but these algorithms, who they they just uh, pushing something and doing something like a trending or, uh, for example, uh, if you have Instagram, you you can see every time like the same colors of trending 
pictures. Or if you have a TikTok, you can also note that sometimes uh, you have uh, uh, same colors of the rooms, like uh, lila, rose, uh, and something blue. And that, uh, that is what was interesting to me, because um, when we talk about technology and uh, in the context of social media, uh, we have this mutual that you can do everything there, you can explore yourself there, but but no, because uh, in, in, in some t something will uh, seems to be really, really same, and um, and you have no choice there because uh, you have to do what the algorithms pushed uh, just pushed um, just upstairs, and you are like a, in this like a victim of this algorithm play. And for me, like um, um, as an artist and uh, as a also user, uh, for me it's uh, interesting to explore it and to make it visible. And that's why I thought um, that for me it's a really physical uh, experience because uh, when I talk about technology, I try uh, to use uh, to make it visible. And uh, uh, that's why I make it also installation that you can touch it, you can try it, and. Um, it's not about like a uh, handy uh, or smartphone like that. And uh, and this is how, uh, that's why I understand what you mean about our bodies. So uh, I tried also like uh, challenging with this algorithm, they create this uh, information bubbles in, in social media. And I also tried to make it visible. And I did it last year as so a one performance, uh, digital performance. It was um, to make visible um, uh, one of of the bubble, uh, I was uh, invited to to make this uh, Instagram performance for three months in in US uh, audience, and I asked it uh, may just simple, simple, typical Instagram question like uh, which color of the nails I have to choose or something like that, and and that also did it. And in the end of this three months performance, we had uh, like a new picture of mine, but it was like visible and and you had like a new person but but this person is a result of this audience so um yeah it's it's uh, and for me when i think about that and um i think how i i, I accept it and 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 for me then what's interesting and really, and of course um uh, challenging that identities in this technology process to destroy and to to born like new you know like and you're this, this fluent identity and you ha you can to be i don't know every time a new person new body new um, something new and uh, that's what uh, for me interesting uh, to to work with these algorithms and to make it visible yeah thank you any comment or any um, questions but I would like to know a little bit more about your practice um, I think like I w uh, Audrey I think like I, w I was wondering about the glitches like how do they manifest in their like their materiality like how do they manifest themselves in your practice like in the objects that you design or yeah Um, so I'd say that uh, I graduated with uh, a project that was looking into the era of, you know, the translation in between softwares to softwares and what was lost, what was gained, how to make this loss visible, how to buy materializing models that I would find uh, glitches, uh, how could we accept the errors um, in the machines, let's say, instead of like um, sm smoothing it. Um, but ultimately, I felt um, so. What I did is like I was tracking daily life movements, so it's very object design based project. Um, and I would um, apply uh, the curves, uh, the track curves, uh, to 3D scans of daily life objects and obtain new meshes that I would 3D print. But ultimately, I felt a bit. Um, I felt stuck. I felt as. Um, I felt the results were 
were so submitted to, um, to the, the, the software and the technique that I, that I had this, uh, um, this lack of self-expression. And as um, I was trying to, um, instead of, I don't, I, I, in, instead of criticizing um, the state of being, I was trying to rethinking how, like how do we re rethink the way we design matter and how we in envision matter. So I was trying to, to find positive proposition. Um, positive, I mean like creative ones. And I, yeah, so I started to to look into digital images processes, but not as um, deconstructing this process, but more um, where are, where could be the, the spaces of freedom um, that would allow creativity, that would allow new shape to, to emerge. And, and so I started to, yeah, f like freely use these processes um, to afterwards materialize um, models that I would craft in a way. Um, but yeah, to me as well, speaking about glitches and errors is as well um, inducing yeah, this idea of uh, value and hierarchy that it would be in between uh, representation and reality, which I, I don't um, make, um, um, I, I, d I don't believe in this dichotomy, let's say. So I, I'm not really looking for the glitches. Let's say that my objects, I like to call them um, tactile illusions and they are assumed as representation and they are not lies, they are, they are, what, they are what they are, let's say. So um, it's how, yeah, I, f I felt stuck in the, um, in the outcomes when algorithms were choosing the, the, um, the, the look of, like, mm, let's say, finding out the glitches in between software would always kind of brought me to the same results. And the visual language of the machines were so dependent on the software that I, I was stuck in that, let's say. So I was trying to find other ways. Maybe you can react with us. Yeah. I think. No, I, I find it really interesting actually because, um, it, so, well, in my, in my work, I kind of like, just allow what whatever has happened in the program to to, to be um and so i i like that kind of I, in a way like my practice is just revealing the states of the technology at this moment in time and maybe you know there's a lot of questions like because i make my work in um you know my my practice has been like very much based in nigeria and sierra Leone, and it's like who's the who are you making this for and when I've like shown my work to the, the mobile phone top up kind of people that I was working with in, in kind of scanning the, the kiosks and stalls where people were selling the, the, the SIM cards, they didn't really care for the, what the mesh or the model kind of came out as. But it seems to be a space where it's like really we're talking about like kind of, I'm kind of saying to, to the West in a way that this is the way that you're reading the landscape and this is the way that I have completely unedited, like I, I really and truly, I'm not really even doing anything. I'm just kind of facilitating the kind of click button and the workflow of the, the mesh. So it's really um, kind of a very stripped back kind of process where you're just kind of um, not, um, I, I'm not really challenging the glitch, but I'm just like presenting it into a conversation of like, this is how um, the landscape is, is seen. And maybe, um, I actually had maybe a question for everyone, um, which um, there was a, there's a discussion about like digestion of data. And um, I guess the, what the working process is a little bit like that kind of digestion kind of flow as well. But what are your thoughts on, um, about like a data leak, if a data leakage happens or, maybe we can even see as like open source um, programs, like um, MetaHuman is almost like a, a bit of a, a data leak in the way that it might change the way that we visualize Avatar or, or um, this type of, it, 
I, I kind of see it like I personally see a data leak or open source software as, as um, a way of controlling um, the way that we work or particular languages. But then maybe um, we could also see data leakages in a in a various other way of of lies or um, some sort of information flow of some sort. Um, I'm posing a question. If anyone has a response to a data leakage. <laughs> slow is the thing. Um, maybe it's not like uh, it's going in a different direction. But one of the image when I was uh, this one of this work that I did, it was about like cleaning data because I wanted to understand how machine were like seeing the were trained to see the world, right? And something that I understood by doing this kind of like work, like uh, cleaning the data for machine to be trained uh, for machine vision to be trained. Uh, I saw that two operations that were like recurring in this kind of like work that I was doing was uh, um, creating bounding boxes, boxing and naming. So segmenting images and then naming them. The by the way is this kind of like modern uh, impulse of like ordering the world uh, and if you want also a colonial way of like seeing the world you're kind of like creating borders and then you name it so you take an image and then you start to create a segment around uh, the person and then the tree and then you say this is a person this is a tree but then at one point i found this image while i was doing this work uh, of a woman who was like lying on her sofa and the t-shirt of the woman was of the same pattern of the sofa. So the woman was like really leaking into the sofa and the sofa was like leaking into the woman. And so at one point I was like, actually this is a woman sofa, a sofa woman. There was this like leaking between these like two entities that to me was like super interesting. And then of course it was not a category for a woman leaking into the sofa and the sofa <laughs> looking into the woman. But so to me, this like leaking into things, uh, that is how we experience the world in which we're like leaking to think in the world, uh, supposedly is leaking into us, uh, like became in that image like quite interesting to think about what is not translatable into this like computational world. Okay. Um. I, I really love the conversation, especially around the question of kind of glitch and data leak together. Um, largely because I think what, what I'm at least learning from this conversation is to keep on emphasizing that data is a value system. To call something a glitch is not a problem. Glitches have existed way before computational art came into being, right? But data as a paradigm insists that if a glitch happens, the human has to be improved in order for the glitch not to happen. So one of the things that we did for the last book was we did surveys of about um, 68 different computer science programs around the world. And we looked at what are the common principles that are taught to data scientists or computational engineers. And one of the first principles they are taught is a GIGO. Does everybody know what GIGO is? It's garbage in, garbage out. It necessarily says that if your program produces a glitch or an error, the program's actually working absolutely fine. The human who has done the programming and the human whose data is in the program are unclean and they need to be now cleaned up so that your program can work well, right? It's an incredible value paradigm, which is essentially saying that every time a glitch appears, the system's logic has to be favored and everybody else or every place else which has to be fed into it needs to be cleaned up in order for the system to reach its desired intention. Wendy Chan, who's one of my favorite media, favorite media theorists, um, she says that data is essentially leaky. There is no such thing as non-leaky data. If you think that data is not leaking, it only means that somebody in power is hiding where those leakages are. And they are hiding it because the leakage of data is where maximum capitalization happens. If I present your name, age, sex, gender, and ethnicity as clean data, I'm not showing to you all the other databases that your data is talking to and leaking this information to because that's where money is going to be made. So Wendy says, you always need to think about data sets as frenemies. They are your best friends who are going to talk behind your back all the time. And if you don't understand data then as essentially leaky, 
and inherently glitchy, then we are buying into the narrative that computational systems are robust and human beings are messy. And the logical conclusion then is that computational systems should make decisions and human beings should just follow them, right? Because we are inherently messy and hence cannot be trusted because we're not predictable in any form. I don't know if you have Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, in terms of, um, yeah, in a way, like it just makes me think of how I um, use, sort of, just I don't know. I guess my mind uh, or whatever I'm, cons whatever I consist of as that kind of processing divide of all these leakages and all the data, and I think that sort of. To me, that is what this digestion, what like any artistic, um, I guess, any artistic gesture is. And kind of when, you, when we also talk about this kind of generative approach and kind of lack of kind of this victimizing position, and only then you can kind of actually make something, actually, I don't know, be the maker of uh, some form of worlds rather than sort of just dwell, dwelling in some sort of uh, meanings. and. I also kind of kept thinking um, about this. I was I was doing some research recently on sort of how memory works, and I um, and the researcher we've worked with, uh, she showed us this very beautiful video of a um, ballerina who has Alzheimer's, who does not like remember anything, but then when um, they started playing sort of Swan Lake, she immediately started dancing. And like, is that what sort of like embodied data is? Um, just kind of, but maybe it's just kind of a wider question um, to, yeah, to anyone who wants to answer it. W like, what is embodied data, to, <laughs> I guess? What is it for, uh, what, what, but like, so this embodied data in in the sense of this idea of something that you don't even understand where it's coming from, right? Or Maybe. yeah. Like, but is the question like what do you, what for you what is embodied data? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Does anyone uh, have an idea of embodied? It's almost like this idea of um, uh, you know, like childhood or all these things that you don't re it, it happening or like traumas, no? Uh, situations in which you act in a way that you don't know where this is coming from. But in fact, it's, it's something that somehow uh, something happened in your past that made you react in specific ways that you're probably unaware of uh, and then it makes you in the future or in a current situation to have a specific reaction towards I'm being very vague to, to what I'm saying I think but I feel that perhaps yeah this idea of trauma or this idea of not really things that you know that happened to you but throughout your education or throughout things that your family or, or how uh, you grew up, these things were embedded towards you, like society, for example, it's giving you all this embodied data that it, you're just perceiving and acting without even uh, understanding that you're acting somehow. So that's, that would be my uh, answer to embodied data uh, to you. I have an answer, but only if nobody else wants to add. <laughs> Okay, not an answer, it's just that I just want to say I love how you are bringing these questions to us. Thank you. I think they are very challenging and it's fun. Um, I have been thinking through, um, I, it's a very personal story. So my grandmother, um, who was 93, she died a couple of months ago, been very close. Um, a few, and she's very tech savvy, or she was very tech savvy. So uh, a few years ago when I was visiting her, she kind of asked me what a selfie is. 
Um, so, you know, took out a phone, took a selfie with my grandmother. She looked at it and then she's like, delete it. I'm like, why? Because I thought she looked fabulous in it. And she's like, you can tell I'm not wearing my favorite perfume in this selfie. And I went into this untranslatability mode saying, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And from there on started like an oral history project. And I realized that my grandmother who, you know, lived for a large part in a very, let's say, tech deficit infrastructure country like India, uh, had only seven pictures of her taken until the time she was 48, right? And out of that, only five remain. And they're all in like this album and it's covered with this beautiful tissue and nobody's allowed to touch it. So I started sitting with her and she would open up those five pictures. And every time she would look at the picture and she would tell a completely different story of what's happening there, right? Uh, sometimes it was about the people in it, but sometimes it was people not in it. Sometimes the dates changed. Sometimes the occasion why this was taken was changed. Some people died, some people did not. I think she was willful and playful. She was also getting old and she was forgetting. But the point is that if I, if I, and I made her tell me the same story of the same five pictures over and over again. If I submitted this to a data set, the algorithm would say that my grandmother is a misinformation peddling liar, right? That she's a bearer of alternative facts, that she should not be trusted. And I think the reason why this happens is that, again, because we use data as a measure of bodies. Does your body measure up to the predictability, the patterns, and the recognizing correlation and causality that data as an ideology brings to the table? I think embodied data is where you get to occupy data and play with it. And every single story that my grandmother said, even though some of them were obviously lies, are still true. Because they are her truth. And that she's able to manipulate that thing, which is that one static image, in order to literally recreate, I don't know, 80 years of memory in those five pictures. And then on the flip, fun side is that I unfortunately introduced my grandmother to Instagram. Um, and then between the six years when she got onto Instagram till she died, so between the ages of 87 to 93, my grandmother has now recreated 1,000 pictures of her past. She has channeled like her sisters and her daughters and granddaughters and grandchildren. She's made us all dress up and she's remembered moments from her past and she's recreated them. She has sepia filtered the hell out of everything so that it looks old and crinkly. And so she has now left a photographic archive of 80 years of her life, which was all made between the last, two, last six or seven years. And this is also embodied data. I think embodied data practice necessarily allows for the human to be unclean and messy and willful and playful and lying and recognizing that all of it, all of it has a different intentionality in the making. And so when a glitch happens, it's not the human that's at fault, it's that the system's paradigm is limited and we need to find a different, different viewpoint, a different standpoint to start talking about it. Okay, sorry, that's a very long story. Again, I tell very long stories. I should stop speaking. <laughs> um, yeah, um, when we speak about glitch and lies and uh, the realities your uh, grandmother creates through telling story through her images, um, and the topic of the conversation about objectivity, um, maybe then I must think about ambiguity. Can, can data be ambiguous? Um, can the digital realm bring more ambiguity, uh, be approached with ambi and thought through ambiguity? I'm, only because I want to name somebody, Namita Malhotra, I'm going to send you a reference to her. Um, she's a feminist queer filmmaker and a data analyst and she talks about how data in itself is always ambiguous because it is only the protocol and the browser that gives it meaning. Take the same set of data and put it onto five different browsers and you suddenly realize that they are all telling a completely different set of reality based on the protocols which are coded into it. Is it? Yeah. Um, the um, conclusion of that would be that the machine is not always right, that there are mistakes. 
um, Ch- the machines never write the machines only write within one particular political ideological context but and this we know and we c- we must keep on highlighting it but for me that means that we have to stop talking about data as the only paradigm of but making realities right so how 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 data could produce more ambiguity in in our materials and body itself in a more meaning, meaningful ways could be a question absolutely like at least in in terms of the work i do with law and policy what it's been really fo- fascinating to realize that if only we institutionalize the right to be forgotten which means that all your data is continuously dying as it should it would immediately produce ambiguous subjectivities and ambiguous conditions of rights and responsibilities because then at some point where you were born or what you did has been erased from data sets because memory has replaced it and then what happens then so this idea of storing data differently erasing it dirtying it is kind of new ways and i think a lot of you actually do it in practice i'm just extrapolating from it all right um i think we 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 have to wrap up the our conversation today for um if anybody has something else to add or to to include to the conversation piece feel free or uh we could con- we can continue also and people can come and ask questions to to you to everyone uh i would like to thank you everyone and to thank you the uzbekistan national pavilion the the organization team to give us the opportunity to to be here um and yeah we have a sequence the next event that we have is in it's in in a month from now we have the the panel there with the i'm sorry i, I don't have the date clear in my mind um uh, but we are having a series of new events coming in the next month june 19th um and so you're all welcome to to come back and we can continue our conversation in here or in a in another place outside thank you very much thank you thank, thank you, you. I remember this fight that happened.